So, in about five months' time, Nigerians will go to the polls in presidential elections. One of the leading contenders is Peter Obi of the Labour Party. And with him in that race are Atiku Abubakar of the PDP, Bola Ahmed Tinubu of the APC, and Rabi Kwankwaso of the NNPP. It's expected to be one of the most important votes since Nigeria returned to democracy in 1999. And the battle between the four frontline candidates, as well as 14 others who are vying for the top job, begins in earnest today, the official start of the campaign season. So how will they win over the voters in a country in which politics often feels a world away from the daily struggles of most Nigerians? How can they convince a skeptical electorate that they are the one who should be chosen at this specific point in the history of Nigeria to bring this country back to the right path of rectitude? Well, to attempt to answer those questions, I'm suitably delighted to say that the presidential candidate of the Labour Party, Peter Obi, joins me now in the studio. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Long day for you then? Very long day. You know, <laughs> starting out the day, having to go to Jaws and then coming back from Jaws. Very long day. Well, we appreciate your tenacity and the fact that in spite of the length of the day, you made it as you promised you would. Help us reimagine Nigeria if you win. What will, be, what will this country be like under your watch? Well, you've said it. Whoever assumes office next year as the president of, Con of Nigeria will be faced with an array of daunting task that he needs to deal with. And I'm looking so insolvable or huge that it can even scare you. Mm. But like I said, with, as difficult as it looks, it is not insolvable. There's quite areas, number of areas to start with. And for me, the number one thing is security. Security today is impacting on virtually all facets of the country. It's impacting the most, what I can call the most important area you need to deal with ordinarily, the economy. Mm. The economy is in a bad shape. But unless you solve your security, you can't live with that. Because it's impacting heavily on that. It's impacting on inflation. It's impacting on your ability to attract investments and everything. So that is the number one thing to deal with. Because if you deal with that, you can then start dealing with your other issues, mm. which includes dealing with ensuring the rule of law under which you have corruption, law and order, bringing about a regulatory environment that can attract investment. And then you move on to other things dealing with the issue of human capital, issue of some physical infrastructure like power, and everything. So security, top of your entry. Number one. But obviously, as you said, a very dark cloud hanging over this country with regard to insecurity in general, kidnapping, banditry in particular. Um, how would you go about actually lifting that dark cloud? Well, I've said it repeatedly. You need to be decisive. It is not impossible. There's quite a number of things which is, I can't disclose here that you need to put in place. Well, that's really what we but want among to them, talk about, isn't it? But among them yes. is multi-level police from local government to state to national. Looking at reviewing the entire security infrastructure 
security architecture. You need to deal with this. Be able to have appropriate manpower, mm -hmm. appropriate equipment, training, support, motivation. It's quite a number of things. Mm. And I can tell you, it's something that I study every single day. I've met various arms of our security system to detailed study compared with other nations of the world and imagining what to do. People will always say, that's the detail we want you to give. No. Once it's security, all I can tell anybody is that I should be held responsible. Right. We will be decisive, we will be precise, because I, I keep saying that is the most critical thing to deal with. If you're talking about the inflation today, the first thing you need to deal with is the food inflation. And that can happen unless you get your farmers back to the farms. And they are not there because of insecurity. Mm. So you need to get them back, support them with implements and what they require to grow more food. Your bis biggest physical asset today is the vast land in the north, which you need to cultivate. I just came back from Jaws. We are ordinarily, if things we are working today, we should have a factory for chips. Especially now that you have fast food all over the place. Because you can grow potatoes there and everything. Mm. You could have coffee, everything, but the farmers are not there. And I ask them. They can't go to farm because of insecurity. So for you to turn around the country economically, you need to deal with that. And it must be sexy. For you to attract foreign investment, local investment, you need to deal with that. Yeah, but obviously reforming the security agencies and the whole security apparatus will take time and is likely to be felt in the medium to long term. But it in might the not take as long as you think. I was going to ask you, in the short term, I can tell what, you, what would you do to bring measurable relief? You will be, as, as long as you're firm and decisive and deal with it firmly, mm. the things that are happening here that you can deal with as quickly as possible. You know, of course, that uh, from your own experience, you've been in office uh, as a governor, um, that running for office is very different from actually being in office. Because if you win, um, that's when it really hits you. And that's when you ask yourself what you got yourself into in a country where victory has so many variables and so many implications. How would you hit the ground running? What would your entry look like? You've talked about security, you've talked about the economy, what else? I agree and disagree. Because I've been in it. This is a time to learn. This is time to ask questions. This is time to listen about what you need to do when you get into office. Getting into office and start saying what you saw when you got in, I think it's not the right thing. No, I think w what I mean. So when you get in there, yes. you should already have an idea, a belief of what you want to do. Yes. I've been there before. But then when you get in, the, well, the, the picture is often different. No, you not, actually not, not much. Right. It might be, but a little bit. Right, okay. Because you have taken time to say, well, listen, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. That was why when I started in my previous experience, mm. I hit the ground running from what they won. And that was why I was impeached within six months because people saw things change very quickly. Yeah, but, but that's and exactly what people want to hear about, how you're going to balance the promises you make in the campaign about all, all the things you, you're going to deal with. And, you know, 
what your actually what your strategy is going to be when you get in. What I can assure you is that, and I say it, I should be held responsible. And wherever I talk now, and I say people, I want you to put on tape. I'm not talking to the spokesperson. I'm talking to you directly, so you know that I'm going to do this. And you can go and ask question in my previous engagement or involvement, whether what I say. So it, what we're going to see now is that all of us are going to say the same thing. All of us are going to promise the same thing, 18 of us. It is a question of who can we trust? Mm. Who can we believe? Can we look back and say what this person said in the past? Did he or she accomplish that? Or even attempt to? You might not achieve 100% result, but people will see 100% effort. And I can tell you, you can do it from day one. And are you prepared for the other outcome, the possibility that you might come tantalizingly close, but still lose? Well, it's an election. It's like going into a match. I'm there to win. And, I'm com and that is my commitment. And I don't think I'll lose. Because there's quite a lot, and even, I don't think even God will allow me to lose because he knows the suffering of the youths and the young people in Nigeria. But on, on a practical level, if you end up not winning an outright majority in this election, which is possible, possibly even probable, because a lot of the, the polls are predicting a very close election. What would your next move be? Well, I won't say what my next move will be, because I think I'll win. And, and if you had to reach out to another of the candidates to form some sort of coalition or alliance, who would it be? Well, I won't say that at this stage. The most important thing for me is that I think I'll win. Because they, they need to start solving the problem of Nigeria. Right. But, but in terms of ideology, if there is any such thing in Nigerian politics and practice, what are the differences between you and Atiku Abubakar of the PDP, for, for instance? I mean, you both belonged to the PDP before you left the party, and you were, of course, his running mate in 2019. Uh, you, 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 I mean, so presumably you share some similarity in terms of your political philosophy and approach. Why should Nigerians choose you in preference to him? Well, first let me tell you, I said it before, there won't be any, there's no different ideology between all of us who are running. Our politics have not matured where you have different ideologies and mm. different beliefs and everything. We are said uh, what you can call developmental level. So there's no much difference. What is what we are competing today or what Nigerians need a choice before the nice of all these people promising the same thing, who can we trust? So what we're selling now is trust. Mm, right. I understand that. And, and um, what we're selling now is character. Did you not trust him when you were his running mate? No, no, I did. I did. That was the yesterday. That was the past. So, so I'm still asking. So for you. me, the past is gone. Right. We're dealing with the future. Things that gotten worse. And at this stage, I think I can solve the problem. Right. I don't want to go to the past. Okay, and, and the reason they would choose you in preference to him is because you're more trustworthy than he no, is. In, is that in, what you're in, saying? No, in preference to all others. Right, including I believe, himself. That I believe that I'm the most qualified. Right. Now let's talk about, let's move away from that and talk about the issue of things like fuel subsidies, which are clearly a huge drain on resources which can be used for the development of Nigeria, which we all know those fuel subsidies are simply unsustainable. Would you have the political will to remove fuel subsidies if you became president and risk the wrath of the very powerful unions that are a big part of your Labour Party? Everybody saw what 
listen to my speech at the Lagos Chamber of Commerce. First subsidy, if you haven't heard it, let me repeat, it's organized crime. 50% of it is corruption. You can deal with it day one. The other 50% is for you to deal with it where you remove it, but you must offer an alternative. Another alternative is what are you going to replace using the same resources? Mm. Nigerians are not against, totally against removal of subsidy. But what is there that you're offering if you're going to remove it? But I said in that, that we will as quickly as possible bring in private sector investment supported us to build refineries, modular refineries, everything that is possible and ensure that since it's for local distribution, self well to them in Ara. The crude to them in Ara. If you do that over a period, I can tell you the price is not going to be as high as people can imagine. I've seen people burn it huge figures. It won't be. I've also done the numbers. And are we going to get a glimpse of what your manifesto looks like? Well, I mean, are you going to codify all of this into a document? Um, I mean, there, there'll be many people who may not get to read. We're going to launch our manifesto very soon. Right. But, but can you give us a breakdown of its essence and the key takeaways from it? I mean, what would you the, the, most want to convey to the public from it? Well, for me, our manifesto is anchored on the sustainable development goals. Hmm. And key that is issues I mentioned before, security, uniting the country, ensuring that our cohesion comes back to what it used to be. Issues of rule of law, law and order, fighting corruption, making the country productive, creating jobs. You can go on and on. Mm. But you don't have that manifesto yet, or, or you have it, you don't want to Our manifesto, it. I can say today, is 95% ready. We, you mentioned it here, we just received from what you call, because we are work, we close with labor, mm. And you see, they have what they call charter of demands, which we need to bring into our manifesto and ensure that the interest, which is critical, labor interest is critical, Absolutely. that we, we bring it into our manifesto and protect them. Right, and let, let me, let me um, move into the foreign policy area, which is obviously critical for you um, because you're going to be working within the international community. What shape is that going to take if you became president? Everything from your, starting from the regions, um, the, your commitment to ECOWAS, to the Africa continental free trade area, which Nigeria seemed reluctant at the outset to sign and ratify, partly as a result of labor <laughs> unions. Um, how would you qualify your commitment to something like that? First is that our foreign policy will remain Africa focused. It is critical, but what is important is that we have to deal with domestic issues. You need to bring about and turn around 
your domestic situation, make it robust and economically viable in order to be able to earn your respect internationally. As for issues of being involved with the Africa free trade and everything, Nigeria is signatory to it. I remain committed to it. Labor is not against it. Labor is against it because you're not productive. If you put in place what will make Nigeria productive, it is actually to our advantage. Where will anybody want to invest in Africa, if not Nigeria? Because you have the biggest market. But it's a market that is today a place where you have the highest number of people, poor people. So your local demand is weak. Mm. Your productivity is weak. So you can't export. So you become un well competitive. And that is a fear because if you open up your borders, everybody is going to join and you have nothing to sell to them. In the reality, we should be the one embracing that. So for me, by the time you move Nigeria from consumption to production, if we start cultivating our vast land in the north, Charles, where are we going to be exporting it to? Africa first. If we start turning around our manufacturing sector, where are we going to sell it? Africa first. So it is our, what we need to do is to quickly as possible put our economy in order, which will create huge jobs. And we was going to send the products to Africa. And of course, an essential part of putting that e economy in order is dealing with the rising debt crisis that this country is facing. How are you going to cope with that? That's going to hamstring you, when you if you come into office. Yes. I've always said there's no problem with debt. It is what you use the money you borrow for. Yeah, but the money that's been borrowed now exceeds the revenue that this country Agree. has. If you increase the revenue, if you do the right things, you will increase the revenue, you will restructure the system debt, and you'll be able to deal with it. There's nothing wrong. Nigerian debt today, even to those who are in it, Nigerian debt today, to GDP mm. is low. Nigerian debt to revenue is high. So what you need to do is to work on the revenue side. And to work on the revenue side is very simple. Remove this country from consumption to production. You can't have a vast country like Nigeria of 260 million people living on 900 to the 30,000 square kilometers of land. Our total export last year, Charles, even by the official rate, because they always argue with me when I use the other rate, is $47 billion. That is unacceptable. What are other countries doing? That is totally unacceptable. A country like Netherlands, if you minus water, it's 33,000 square kilometers of land. Belgium is 30.9 thousand square kilometers of land. These two countries are just 64,000. In terms of population, Belgium is 12 million. Their land is about 17.5. Call it that two of them is about 30 million people. Total export 2021 is about 1.2 trillion and 260 million people could not do living on 900. If you minus, the, 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 this, we still have 800 and something thousand square kilometers remaining. If you minus 30,000, our population is still about 180. And we cannot do 5% of the export. Come on. And our youth, very talented, 
energetic, all you need is invest in them. Very simple. Every other country of the world is doing it. If you invest in our youth today, if you train them, invest in them today, they'll change the world. All these boys you're chasing and say, yeah, you, your boys, are the talents you're missing that can change the world. They are your Bill Gates. They are your bezels. All you need is to do, there's a lot this country can do. So it's a question of turn it around, increase your revenue, because the more you pull people out of poverty, you're not getting revenue today because you have 100 million people living in poverty. You have the highest youth unemployment in the world. The more you put them out of poverty, the more you get revenue. You can't go and tax people who are not doing anything. You cannot, because they're not productive, there's no income coming from that. So you have a problem. Mm. I, I think most people would agree with you that there is a problem. I mean, you mentioned this at the outset. The key issue here is the solution. And you're not telling us what the solution is. The solution is, is that... That's so what I'm telling you. You have to pull this youth out of poverty. Yeah, but how? What, you, what are you going to do? Very simple. You see, you just said about our debts. Mm. If those monies we borrowed were properly invested, we wouldn't be where we are today. Yeah, but if they were not properly invested, which is which is what you're suggesting, because what they would were then consumed? Yeah. What What would you so then the do new, the to new, fill the gap? Thank you. The new resources you're going to get, whether borrowed or not, you invest it. Just let me give you an example. If I read a news recently which says Nigeria in the past 20 years has borrowed 225 trillion naira over the past 20 years, mm. let's say it's 200 trillion, which if you divide by 500, will give you about $400 billion, if I'm right. Tony Elumelu, his um, foundation, MD, told in this hotel, during a, a symposium, or one of his events, said that for every $5,000, they gave her out to an entrepreneur, young fellow, after one year, he or she creates 20 jobs. After one year. Assuming we had done what other countries of the world had done, decided to support these young people and spend a quarter of that $400 billion on them, Hundred billion dollars would have been divided five five thousand would have gone to twenty million entrepreneurs. Assuming they created a quarter of the job, just a quarter of the job, she said they will create if they give them five thousand. That is hundred million jobs. Who we'll have not more than two or three percent unemployment today. That's what the country of our size needs. Indonesia have less than 10 percent. They are 220 something percent. That's the country of our size. Mm -hmm. Vietnam, all these countries have f unemployment less than 10 percent. That's where we should be if we had done the right things. And you can still do it. It will be difficult, as I said, it will be difficult, but it's not impossible. There's areas you can start today dealing with. When I talk about insecurity, your greatest source of foreign exchange revenue today, 50% or more, is stolen. Oil. This is where you have to provide security, ensure you earn those money, curtail your corruption, deal with cost of governance, deal with issues of subsidy. All this, when you deal with them, you bring down your exposure to a manageable level, which gives you room to earn more revenue, gives you room to even borrow more, but this time strictly for investment, mm. not for consumption. If you remove subsidy today, management of your 
that comes to a level you can manage it. Helps your inflation because this is what is physical recklessness that is what's in our inflation today. It's physical recklessness that, that is pushing our exchange rate towards out. There's so many things you can deal with. And these things are not difficult. And 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 if I mean you 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 use the the term restructure a number of times. I mean, you talked about restructuring the security services, you talked about restructuring the economy and, and all the rest of it. Are we likely to see a major political and fiscal restructuring of Nigeria if you win, as some of your key supporters are demanding, or you're not likely to go that far? No, it is my, it's, remember I said, we need to restructure the country. Mm. It is for the good of the country. But, but are we talking about constitutional Yes, it will be, but that right. will take time. Right. But there's one you have to deal with. Right. You can't wait, we can't wait to start pulling people out of poverty until the constitution is changed. No, it's like certainly somebody that you're waiting, that they, they can't eat until so so. No, 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 no. Mm. Pulling people out of poverty, you don't need to wait for that type of restructure. Dealing with issues of security, you, know, you don't need to wait for constitutional restructure. Those ones will happen, but they will happen. I'm determined. I believe in it, and it is for the interest of the whole nation. We will agree. We're not going to. It's not as if it's something I'll get in there and say, "Okay, this is going to happen." No. What you need to do is to bring a conversation. A dialogue that can make for the society. We're in a democracy. You're not going to rule by force or by fears, but by consensus. So you're going to start talking. People need to start hearing you. All this is I'm promising. You need to communicate it to the people. The people have to see visible, measurable movements. No excuses. Mm. No blames. It is not the job of a leader is not blame to be living in blame. It's not to be given a school, it's to provide a solution and solving problems. So communication is essential. Precise. Mm. But embedded with solving the problem and providing solution. Right. Not to be blaming or complaining. It's not to you to say, oh, what I saw or what these people did before I came in. No, 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 no. If those people were doing well, we won't hire you. We hired you not to remind us about the past. Mm. So the, the young people today want to hire me, not to start reminding them that they were, they, they were, they are, they were jobless yesterday, but that I've started providing them job. We are now at 35% unemployment, 55% youth unemployment. So the next time I'm talking to them and telling them, yes, We've now gone down to 40, 45. We've gone down to 45, 40, 35. That's what they want to hear. Not to remind them about the past. Not to give them an excuse why it wouldn't happen. Mm. No, no, no. That's not the job of a leader. And you, you talked about this new Nigeria that you envision where communication is an essential part of it. Bringing all the disparate elements together so we can sit at a table and, and talk. Would you, for instance, be prepared to sit down and negotiate with militants and, everybody. and bandits and Ev terrorists? No, no, no. Let me tell you, everybody, those who are agitating, those who are disagreeing, you first start by a dialogue. You first start by discussing. No matter who, hmm. I will discuss with everybody so that you know when to draw a line and say, well, listen, We've tried to use the risk. We've tried to use it. It's not working. And that's it. So in, as a short-term stopgap measure for dealing with insecurity, you would sit down no. with, with bandits if, if, and if, terrorists? If bandits so. are not among the people I'm going to discuss. Right. Bandits are bandits. So criminals you're going to hit criminals. them with a hammer? That would be what I'm going to do with them. But I'm going to, I'm going to deal with it decisively. Right. Those who want to be discussed will be discussed with. Those who are agitating, those who feel unhappy, those who are not this, 
My job is to bring them to the table. You leader, you must listen, you must learn, you must dialogue. That is why you're there. Mm. And you must communicate to the people. That's why they hired you. I like the word hired. Yes. That's an important word. That's what we're doing now. We're trying mm. to hire the new CEO of the enterprise called Nigeria. So the, everybody now has to come with the CV and say, this is what I can do. And you have to communicate it to the people. Like I said, I'm saying it to them directly. Not to progs, not to spokesperson. So they can take notes of what I say, mm. I will do. And when, when I get in there, see it visibly, measure it. And of course, um, in, in the process of talking directly to those people, as you put your CV to them and they interview you for the job, um, they will need to know about yourself. I mean, you're one of the front runners and one of the main players in this election. Who is Peter Obi? Just you know me. Just well, not me, for my the audience. Na my name is Peter Obi. I thought so. Everybody knows. I will have the day of my date of birth is known. They know where I was born. I was born in Onitsha. I was born, they know, everybody knows where even I was born. In a place they call Waterside Hospital. It's known everywhere. I went to a school beside the waterside called Santa Maria and St. Augustine, Mobana. And I went to the Christian King College. I think I went to the same secondary school as you. I was there very briefly yes, for a year. So it, that's it. So at least you know that I went there. Everybody knows the secondary school I went to. And from there, I went to University of Nigeria and Soka. Everybody that was in Soka when I was there, at least one word, you had to know there was somebody called Peter B in the university. And I left there, and I had other, I've been part of other schools, like Oxford, Cambridge, mm. and everything. So this is me. I'm married, I have two kids, two graduates, one girl, one boy, you know, happily married, everything. And that's it. And, and talk to us about your route into politics and public service. Was that always an area of interest for you? Was that always what you had in mind when you started your professional career? I don't know how I, don't know how I got involved <laughs> with that chance. You know, everybody knows my career. I was a trader. I was a businessman. I'm a well creator. I'm, I'm, I'm somebody who likes, I love trading. I love business. You know, I mean, it's something I do every day, even to today. I like saying, okay, well, listen, if we do this, this is going to, and that's what I do. Too. I consult and advise people today. But obviously, I can't do it again because I found out that the public space needs more people hmm. of character, integrity, competence, capacity, commitment to do the right thing. You because if you get it, you deal with one of the greatest problems of this country today, you know it, is corruption. So when you're talking about where are you going to get the money, if you reduce the money people are stealing, if you reduce waste, you're going to deal with it. Charles, we're the only OPEC country that is not producing our quota, apart from Venezuela, because of what? They have sanctions in our own is because of stealing, because of all sorts of things. And you know that nobody can steal oil unless you are powerful or you're involved with government. And I can tell you, look at the, look at the laws. In July alone, July alone, out of 1.8 million barriers we allow daily, we could only do 1 million 83,000 losing 717 per day a country that needs every one every one dollar one day we need it we're losing 717 multiplied with 31 days charge is 22 million 227,000 barriers in july and an average of 110 thousand dollars we lost two billion four hundred and forty-five million dollars. That's what we lost. 
In August, it was even worse. 975 barrels a day. We were losing 8 to 25. Multiplied by 31 days, about 25 million barrels. An average in August was about 100. So he lost $2.5 billion in August. It can't go on this way. So what are you going to do about corruption then? I mean, beyond plugging the holes, will you be arresting people, prosecuting them? Charles, first is that I'm not going to do well on yesterday. Yesterday is gone. I've said it before. You can't shut your shop and be chasing thieves. Because by the time you come back, goods have expired, you've lost customers. So you're in a worse situation. So we're going to deal with it from the day I start. Charles, I said all of us are going to say the same thing. But how do you know, evaluate us based on issue we discuss corruption. How did the person manage the last opportunity where he serves? The measure of corruption perception index today is one thing. How you manage public resource. So if you're a governor, includes allocation of land. Did you allocate all of them to yourself, to your wife and your family? Appointments. How did you do the appointments? Physical management of funds and everything. Charles, go to Anambra State. If you see one land of Anambra State government allocated to P2B, directly or indirectly, come out stop contesting. Go to Anambra State and see whether there's anybody related to me that will serve as a commissioner. Come, I will stop. I can go on and on. Of course, you know how I manage their money. Anybody can accuse me of anything, but Charles, I left in three banks in Nigeria. I didn't say one. Access Bank, $50 million and over 10 billion naira. Fidelity Bank, $50 million over 12, 10 billion naira. Diamond Bank, $50 million over 10 billion naira. Nobody asked me to do this. I decided that we must have a future savings. And I started saving. These are money that were converted into anything. Use it anyhow. I was number one in NDG, Million Development Goals. So it wasn't because of lack of achievement. We were number one state by the time NDG was concluded in the year 2015. Recognized by the presidency and the UNDP that Alan Black performed number one in that measure, clear measure of development. Because we deal with the issue of pulling people out of poverty, issue of education, issue of health. So this is not, it's just like saying today, Bloomberg released a poll, it's not Pitobi and Sons poll. This is UNDP. I can't manipulate them. So when people say to me, oh, you didn't achieve it, I said, UNDP. There's only one measure of development from 20, year 2000 to year 2015, Millennium Development Goals. That's what China used. India, development agenda, that made them to pull 439 million people out of poverty. I became governor of Anambra State in 2006. We started implementing it in 2008. So we lost seven years. Right. But the year 2015, I was number one in the country. I wasn't owing one salary, anybody, government, civil servant, salary, pension, gratuity, the day I left office. No contract or supplier who had consummated 
his transaction or executed his contract that was being owed. And I left equivalent as I then 75 billion naira of half a billion dollars. Until today, Anambra has not paid me one naira as entitlement since I left office. So go and check. That is, why, why am I saying this? If you say you're going to manage corruption, let's see how you manage the last one. Right. Okay. Well, so we can trust you. They said penny wise. Pound foolish. Well, I, I'm so sure. So if you can manage a penny, we can give you a pound. Yes, I, I'm sure this is going to come up again and again because That's obviously it. we've entered the campaign season now. That's but it. I want to tell you that I'm enormously grateful to you for taking the time to come and talk to us and to the millions of people who are watching you tonight. You had a very long day, but you kept your word and you came here. And we're very grateful for that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Mr. you for having me. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Peter B is, of course, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party.